a journey is marked by the beginning and end, Genesis to conclusion. Yet where we find ourselves is in the midst of this journey. We have been called to the greatest journey to live out our lives for the honor and glory of Christ. This journey is for the resilient, the brave, the determined. Yet God has called us the, the broken, the disheartened, the lost. Fully knowing our inadequacies, he has stepped into the gap and has equipped us with all that we need. He has given us a map. But a map only shows the way to go. It's our choice to walk in it. Step by step, season by season, decade upon decade. It's our choice to follow the path, even when we can't see where it's leading, because we trust in the God who designed it. This path is not new, it is not unknown, and it is not meant to be traveled alone. It has been tried and forged by the faithful generations that have gone before us. The path has been made clear Will we choose to walk in it? Hey, good morning. Let me just extend my uh, welcome to you as well. Uh, my name is Dave Jacobson. I am lead pastor here at City on Hill and just so glad that you've joined us for worship uh, as we've just been um, so well reminded uh, by that great little bumper video. We're jumping back into our Ancient Paths series. We just wanted to hear that voice for another few more weeks, you know, right? Like that, uh, I always feel like a little little sort of self-conscious about my voice after uh, trying to preach and, and hearing that. But we're so glad that you're here this morning and um, it is a COVID full room this morning. I recognize that, so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, you know, hey, our... Uh, philosophy, our kind of desire all along is that we would have enough space for anybody to join in person that desires. And so um, this is about as full as we can probably get in this room with still having some space. Um, some of you might be sitting a little closer to someone than maybe you want. I don't know. Or maybe they came with you and you still wish that they were a little further away. I'm not sure. Um, but know this, that uh, we're going to continue to monitor capacity. And our plan has always been all along, as soon as we need to, to open up another service and so if we need to create more seats and kind of do it that way and have two services on Sunday morning, we would love to do that. The last thing we want to do is turn anyone away who would desire to come in person. It's so good to be here and in this place. And so uh, just know that. And then I just want to greet all of you that are joining online. I know that most of our church is there. Uh, we've got about maybe a third, a little more uh, that kind of comes in person. The rest of you are there online. And so I just want to say hello to you. And man, we long for the day when we can all be back together in this place and uh, uh, we just pray that that day comes quickly. Um, but in the meantime, we've got this and it is uh, working you know, as best as we can do it. So, hey, let's get into uh, God's word this morning. Uh, go ahead and grab your Bible. Hopefully you got one with you. Uh, if you don't, you can download one or find one um, online. But uh, would it really uh, encourage you to open up your Bible so you can see we're going to be in Acts, the book of Acts this morning, chapter four. As you're turning there, I just want to kind of remind us, because it's been a few weeks, of where we're coming from and where we're going in this series. Um, this whole uh, series called Ancient Paths, we've been looking at these ancient spiritual disciplines. And uh, this sort of name comes from uh, Jeremiah 6.16, which says this, Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is. And that is what we are trying to do is to not look at the new fad, the new thing, kind of the next best uh, sort of new technique or, or, or thing. We want to, what's the ancient paths? What are the things that have been tried for centuries and, and that God's people have, have followed in and that God has given that we might what? That we might walk in it. And that really is the goal, that we would walk in it and find rest for your souls. And the whole reason that we began this series, it kind of birthed out of a series we did in the fall. We, we took some weeks and we looked at God and his character and who he is, and these disciplines are our right response to him. And so let me, again, just wave reminder, I'm sure you all took like copious notes and you've been reviewing them ever since, so maybe you could do this next part, but I just by way of reminder that the disciplines 
is not by any way which we achieve or earn any sort of favor or righteousness or goodness before God. It's not that at all. And so if that's what you think, that's what you hear when you think about disciplines, is like, how do I earn more favor with God and become more godly? That's not what the Bible says about disciplines. What the Bible says about disciplines is this is the way that we grow in Christ-likeness, right? And we experience a greater relationship with him. This is the way that we relate to God. This is the way that we are following after him is by doing these disciplines by God's grace, in God's grace, for God's glory, okay? So there's a very big difference from those two things. And uh, we have been through many disciplines. Let me throw a list up of, of what we've already uh, covered so far in this series. Right there on the left-hand side, you can see what we uh, kind of hit in the late fall, early winter. We talked about meditation, worship, witnessing, thanksgiving, community, and silence and solitude. And then uh, for the next several weeks, that list on the right is what we're going to tackle next. So kind of the second part of this Today we're talking about prayer, we're going to be talking about fasting, serving, giving, and growing. And as you look at that list, those are just kind of the words we've chosen. There's not some, um, you know, all-encompassing list of the disciplines that you have to master as a follower of Jesus. Rather, what we see is all these examples and illustrations and certain things that we see the followers of Jesus doing. And so that's what we're growing from. That's what we're going after is doing that together. And so uh, today we're talking about the spiritual discipline of prayer. And we're looking at Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. And I just want to say at the outset, prayer is one of those things that honestly we cannot talk enough about. I feel like just about every three months we need to do a series on prayer that lasts for about three months. Like it's one of those things that we, as much as we teach on it, as much as we talk about it, as much as we study on it, it's something that we can always have more of, always grow deeper in, and that is what we want to do. And what we see throughout scripture, there's a whole lot of different ways that we can go as we look at and study and kind of learn about prayer. Uh, But what we see in scripture is we have many examples of prayers. Uh, We have prayers that Jesus prayed. We have prayers that that the kings of of Israel prayed. We have uh, prayers that David prayed, and and many of them are recorded in the Psalms and kind of in this sort of song version. And then we have prayers of the early church and believers there. And so what we're going to do this morning in Acts 4 is a prayer of the early church. Um, We're going to jump in just um, not long after the day of Pentecost. The church is just sort of breaking onto, has erupted onto the scene, and they are uh, trying to figure everything out, and you see them respond in prayer. And it's one of the longer recorded prayers that we have in the book of Acts. And I think the reason that the author Luke writes that down for us is so that we can learn from it, that we can model our prayers after it, and that we can be reminded of what it is that we are doing when we pray. And so I, uh, I want to save all of the rest of our time for getting into the passage and seeing it. So that's what I've got as far as uh, um, kind of to get us introduced to it. Let me begin by praying and ask that God would teach us as we talk about uh, this passage this morning and learn from it. Would you pray with me? Our God, we do. We thank you for the time that we've already shared, worshiping you, God, lifting your name up in worship. And God, we thank you from the for the reminders, God, for the truth, for the encouragement, for the promises that we heard in your word as your people read those before us. And God, now as we turn our attention to this passage, Lord, and we seek to understand and meditate upon it, God, seek to apply it to our lives, I pray that you will lead us now. Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate the meaning For us, God, that you would help us to uh, apply that which we see. Lord, that we would be uh, quick to hear, God, slow to speak. God, that we would be active in doing the things that you've called us to do. Lord, we desire to be a praying church. Help us this morning to grow in that, to grow in this discipline of prayer. Lord, I ask that you would reveal where it is that we need to uh, learn and grow in this. God, we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let me read the passage, and then we're going to walk our way through it. That's what we like to do around here, and uh, so that's what we're going to be doing this morning. Verse 23 of chapter 4 in Acts, it says this, when they were released, this is Peter and John that they're talking about, to the apostles, uh, some of the early leaders of the church, they went to their friends 
and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Uh, When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them? Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servant to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. All right, well, we're going to walk our way through this passage. The first thing we need to see is that at all times, prayer is our needed response. Prayer is our needed response. Um, Peter and John is the they there, as I mentioned, and they had just been arrested. Uh, They were arrested for um, healing somebody, and uh, they um, were were, were taken away. They had been preaching, and and they... um, were threatened that if they continued to preach and continued to talk about this Jesus who had been raised from the dead, uh, that there was going to be further consequences, right? And so they were sort of released with this, hey, don't do that anymore. And upon being released, they went back to their friends. They told them what had happened, and the natural and right response for them was prayer, um, Pastor Ed uh, Stetzer last week so uh, well put it for us that fear is the opposite of faith. Um, Here in their response, this was not a response of fear, but rather one of faith. And for us, I think you know and you've seen probably times when fear can be so paralyzing for us. And imagine the fear that they would have had uh, in that place. They're excited about what God is doing. This church is is beginning and beginning to grow and sort of taking off. And then here in this place, they um, immediately are confronted with this um, persecution and this this stopping of doing what, what God had called them to do. And they would have been tempted to be in fear. But instead, they chose to act in faith and they prayed. Instead of choosing to be stopped by fear, they, went to, they chose to go forward in faith. And I think it's just a reminder for us and why I think this passage is such a good um, just reminder now is that we face obstacles to the gospel all around us, all around us. You know, we live, and I think it has been this way for some time, but a, I would say a pretty spiritually numb culture. I don't think that most people uh, don't think necessarily about spiritual matters, but they don't like thinking about spiritual matters. And if they do, it often is sort of shallow and sort of uh, all over the place. And, and the things of God, the things that we see in his word here are not always the things that get the airtime around us. And so we need to recognize that this culture, this place that we live in is sort of spiritually numb to the truths of God. And in addition to that, we have many obstacles that would prevent us from feeling any sort of spiritual need, right? Like we have uh, some of the greatest or the greatest medical advancements of all time, right? Like we have taken out things of the equation that for generations, for centuries, people have faced, have been afraid of, have died of, and we have found cures and, and medication and vaccines and all of that. That's sort of what's put us into a frenzy over the last year, right? Is, is now all of a sudden we kind of enter into this new time and wait, what's, what's this? We don't have a quick stop or a quick way to, to stop this. And so in some ways it's kind of, for many, I think it's awakened this spiritual awareness because all of a sudden that death is sort of put back at our uh, doorstep, if you will, and we are faced with that in a very new way. 
and just reminded of it. I mean, all around you, um, as I look upon uh, the, the congregation, I mean, we're all wearing these masks to protect, protect us in this medical way. The reason that you're not here in the room with us and watching at home is because of this place. And so, but when things are good medically, we can maybe think that we are invincible in that. And I would say we enjoy so many other conveniences and, and things here, especially in our country, uh, that we can just go. And if you want a chicken, you don't have to like raise a chicken and kill a chicken. You just go and buy that little pre-wrapped package um, from the refrigerator. Even better than that, if you don't even want to cook the chicken, you can just buy that pre-cooked and press a few buttons. And 30 seconds later, you've got like a warmed up chicken. Like how removed are we from the process of what it has taken to get to that place? See, here's the thing. I say all that because we, this is the culture in which we are existing, living, and we face obstacles to an awareness of our need for God in so many ways. You know, we're going to talk about it a couple times. How can we not? I mean, this week in our country, it was um, certainly a sad, um, a sad st- state that we were uh, that we saw um, what happened there at the Capitol and and all the surrounding things after that I mean it's just it's sad to see the place that we've gotten to right and things have been continuing to grow and it's not it's not calming down it's not we're not coming closer together we're we're, we're creating this greater divide and, and what we saw was just a huge awakening of man this is not slowing down and what I think we see, if, if I could just kind of point us to the clearest, demonstra- or the clearest thing that you're seeing there, is you're seeing people chasing after a God that will never satisfy. They're seeking a king that will never rule rightly. They're seeking a system that will never save them. And if we are ever, or we ever find ourselves in that place that we think something or somebody or some system or some whatever is going to be the thing that is going to save us, it just won't. That is what we are seeing played out all the time. We've seen that in so many ways. And so here we have these followers of Jesus And their leaders, Peter and John, imprisoned and then told that they can no longer proclaim the news of this Jesus who was raised, right? And so they get back and they go to their friends. And what's the first thing they do? They respond in prayer, in faith, asking God to move. And here's a good reminder for us is that prayer should be our first response, not our last might want to write that down. Prayer should be our first response and not our last. How many times is it our last resort? Sort of, well, I don't know what else I can do. I guess I'm going to pray. That's not what we see in the church at all. In fact, a New Testament church is a church that responds in prayer right away. That was the response that they had. And we, are, we can turn to many places in scripture, but let me just bring up Romans 12, 12, which says this, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. This is the prevailing description of our prayer is that that should be unceasing. It should be constant. It should be all the time. And as you read this prayer, you get the sense that this wasn't the first time that the church was praying together. Of course they're going to pray, right? Of course we're going to stop what we're doing and we're just going to ask that God would work. Rather than kind of flip, flipping out and getting all freaked out about it and trying to figure out our plan, what we're going to do is we're just going to go to God and ask that he would give us faith. You know, I think so many times as I, you know, was thinking about prayer and, and how, how do we incorporate this discipline, right? That's what we're talking about is these disciplines. So how do we grow in the discipline of prayer? I think so often our problem with why we don't discipline ourselves in prayer is, is maybe we either don't know or, or don't remember a one of two things. The first is I think we often forget our need of prayer, Right? We, don't just, we don't value it to the point that we need to and we forget just how much we need it or we just haven't made the provision for it to be a constant in our lives. Like we haven't made it this discipline that we go to and that we respond in. And if I could, if I could just kind of illustrate for a second what I mean by that by talking about flossing. And let me just be clear, I don't mean like the, the, the dance, you know, that my kids do, like I, you know, they make fun of me for doing, okay, not that flossing, okay, I'm talking about the dental hygiene flossing, there you go, your pastor just flossed for you, um, just my gift, you know, happy new year, and uh, no, we're talking about dental hygiene, the flossing, and if I could just confess and kind of be honest for a moment, I do not like flossing, 
And I'm not all that consistent in doing that. Did I just like lose a ton of points? Anyone else like be so bold to say, like anyone else like not a great flosser? Thank you, okay. And there's more of you that I know you're not raising your hand and it's true because we just don't always like to floss. Now, others of you are on the way opposite end of the spectrum. Like you wouldn't think of going like but five hours without flossing, right? Like you've got a system down. I know Pastor Scott is one of those. He is an avid flosser. And so we are on polar opposites there. And so um, every year I, I try and put systems and different things in place. I'm gonna floss better, floss better. And so here we are in the new year. And I, I knew I was talking about flossing this morning. So I flossed this morning um, and uh, it felt good. No, it didn't. It never feels good. I hate flossing. I don't know if my teeth are just too tight or how it kind of works or I just do, I'm doing it wrong, but I just, I don't enjoy doing it. But here's the thing. Those of you that are good at it, that do it regularly, uh, you know the value. You value it. You understand what it does for your mouth and for your teeth. And you've made some decisions to make it a discipline in your life. Uh, Those of you who don't, either have never made the discipline for it or you don't value it. Maybe you know that it's you know, gonna affect some things, but you haven't seen those effects yet, so you're kind of holding off a little bit. And here's the thing. I use this kind of terrible illustration because flossing isn't even on the same plane as prayer, right? Like, <laughs> how, how are we comparing flossing to prayer? Like, these are two totally different things. Yet, yet for some of us, If we're honest, we've made more of a value of flossing and we have more of a discipline of flossing than we do of regular prayer in our lives. And maybe you're not a great flosser like me and and, and sub in something else. Uh, We are good at disciplining ourselves in the things that we value. You could say it this way, it shows how much you believe in the power of prayer in that how much you pray. If we believe of what prayer is and who we're praying to and what prayer does, then we will respond in that. And so this morning, my hope is that we would be reminded of both, that we'd be reminded of the value of it, the unsurpassing value that we have of being able to go to the God of the universe in prayer and talking directly to him, but then that we would make provision for that in our lives, that we would discipline ourselves, that we would set aside time, that we would create some habits, that we would you know, make the provision that we would have regular prayer as a part of our lives. And maybe if, it's, if, it, if it can just kind of, if I can milk just a little bit more out of that illustration, maybe as you are flossing or brushing or doing whatever it is that you're doing, that that would be a reminder. When you find yourself doing a habit, or discipline, would it maybe remind us of this discipline of prayer? Would you even begin by taking the time that you're brushing your teeth or flossing that you would begin to pray even then and would that maybe grow into a greater discipline? You see, for the early church, at all times, prayer was the needed response. And not just to pray, But they had this plan and kind of provision for this, right? It was the natural response. They just go straight to prayer. And I wonder, we know that it's the needed response, but is it our natural response? And I think it's worth pointing out that it's not just for the spiritual elite, right? You see who they went to? Look back at your copy of scripture, verse 23. They went to their, what does it say there? This is where you talk. They went to their (laughs) friends, yeah, I love it. I think masks just make us feel like we're like, kind of like, you can't see me. You know, like my little two-year-old boy, like he like puts a pillow over his head and like, I can still see you. You can still talk, all right? So they went to their friends, right? They didn't go to like just the spiritual elite, just those with title apostle or something like that. It was just the gathered church. It was their friends. It was their family. They're just in their homes and they're calling out to God. And I think that's worth noting as well because at all times, it's not just that you go to the pastor or to the elder or to that spiritual giant in your life and they're the ones who pray. No, no, we are all called to be in response of prayer. This is the response of the gathered church. All of us are disciplining in this together. This was ordinary people calling out to God. And there is no verse in scripture that says that my prayers or any other leader's prayers are any more powerful than yours. So if that's like a thought that you've had that I gotta get the pastor to pray because like he's a little like closer to God or God kind of hears his voice, but that's, (laughs) 
You're not getting that from Bible, okay? That is something that you're just kind of imagining. God hears your prayers. He responds to the prayers of his people and he is responding to their prayers here. Let's keep going. Look at verse 24. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and here's what they said. They said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, and here they're quoting Psalm 2. Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. You see, this is the second thing we need to remember when it comes to prayer is that we, we are called to, we're going to call out to the sovereign God of creation. See, it's so important as we pray that we need to remember who it is that we are addressing when we pray. They spent the first five verses that we have here addressing who God is and only the following two for asking for something. I think that's a good kind of structure for our prayers. As we address God, we remind ourselves of who he is. See, you're not reminding God of who he is. He knows who he is. When you're praying and, and, and saying these things, you're reminding yourself of who God is, which is so much of what prayer is. I mean, so many times we think that prayer is getting God on our page, right, or on our program. And so many times what God is doing in prayer is the opposite of that. God is getting us on his page, on his program, reminding us of who he is. And so this prayer, they begin by addressing him and saying who he is. And they take these first five verses to tell God who he is and two things stick out. First, they remind themselves, they pray to God as the creator of all things. Notice what it says, sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. This is an important point to remember as we pray to God that he is the creator of all things. He made this earth and everything in it. He made you and I. He knows us. He sees our thoughts. He is intimately involved with the details of this world. He's not just far off and distant and standing back. Rather, his hands are in everything and he has the power. That's what we see in that is he is powerful. He created all of this. And so they remind themselves, God, you are the creator. Secondly, you see that they remind themselves that he is not just the creator, but he's the ruler. Notice they address him, sovereign Lord. And then they quote this Psalm 2, which Psalm 2 is actually on my own private sort of personal uh, study of God's word. That's one of the Psalms that I studied this week. And, and what a great reminder um, as I, I remember opening my Bible, and this is, the, this is what I read on, um, was it Wednesday or Thursday morning? Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves against the rulers, were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. So what we continue to see is the peoples and the nations raging and plotting and trying to figure things out and kind of go their way, right? I keep thinking of judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and that's what they're responding to. That's what they're seeing. They're remembering that, look, the peoples plotted, the Gentiles raged when they took Jesus, who was the Messiah, who came, and they hung him on a tree. They killed him. They crucified him. And this was the Messiah that had been prophesied for centuries. Yet why, does he, why do they put that in here? Well, they say that through the mouth of David, your servant said that this would happen. And then verse 27, it did. Truly, in this, in this city, we saw this. There were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, right? Jesus was the one sent by God, his only son, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, two of the main players in this whole thing, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. What did they see him do? They saw him kill this anointed one. They rose up against Jesus, but notice what it says in verse 28, to do whatever your hand in your plan had predestined to take place. So we just need to remind ourselves of this, that God is not surprised by the events that we read in the news or hear in the news. He knew before all of creation that that was going to take place. He's not caught off guard. He's not surprised by any of this. And some of us have a real hard time knowing that because we ask the question, well, if God is sovereign, right, why doesn't he change it? Why doesn't he do something about it? Like if, if he's sovereign, and if he's all powerful, then why is there still pain? Like why is he allowing this to go? 
And to that, we would just say, first off, he is sovereign, right? And you and I are not. I can't even get my flossing down, right? And, and, and he is the ruler of all things. He knows a few things that we don't know. But what we do know and what we do see about God is that he is all loving as well. And the way that he is working things out and the way that he is working in all these things, trust me, he is still just as much on the throne and he is using all of it. I know for some of you that's a hard truth to hear because you're like, wait a second. What about my child who has walked away? What about my dad who is facing difficulty and sickness? What about my struggles here? What about my depression? What about my abuse? What about the things that I've walked through? And all of us could stand up and we could list these things and say, why would God, who's sovereign, allow these things to take place? But notice that is not the question that they were asking. They're trusting that God is going to work all things out. And he says that. He says that he works in all things for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that he takes it all away, that he removes all of it, that he takes them away and out of the trial. That's not what it says. It says that he is sovereign and he is working in it. And so what I would just lovingly tell you and urge you this morning is if you find this place in, this, in a spot where you're questioning and you're saying, why God, why? Why would you do this? Can I just say, that with his perspective and on the other side of all this, I promise you that he is using even the worst of things in your life for your good and ultimately it will result in his glory. He took the worst thing that had ever happened in all of humanity, his own son hung on a tree and he used that to redeem mankind, to save his people from their sins, to offer the forgiveness of sins. He did what evil men did and he used even that for his good and for his glory. I have no idea what, what this year awaits, right? We're off to a good start. And, and, and so I don't know what we're going to encounter this year, but I do know this, that God is still sovereign over all of it. And see, that is in our prayers, we have to begin there. God, you are powerful. God, you are sovereign. You are the ruler of all things. And so as I pray to you, I am praying to you knowing that and in that way. I think it's so helpful to remind ourselves of why Jesus came, right? This was the reason that he came. The one who created in power everything and ruling over it all, he came to earth as a man, right? And that was the trajectory of his life was for the cross. Jesus didn't come just to teach, though he certainly taught some great stuff, right? Jesus didn't come to heal Though he did heal and he saved some people from some, some major illness and some things that they needed. He didn't come just to set an example, although it is a good example to follow what Jesus did. He came to die. He came to give up his life on a cross in place of us for our sins. And the power that raised him is the power that is working us today. The resurrection happened to show that he has the power to save and he has the power to forgive. And so as we pray, let's begin in this place that God is bigger than us and he's in, more, in control of more things than us and he knows more things than us and he is bigger than any other ruler or authority. He's better than any other collective or any other place that we could point. He is God and he is the one that we are praying to so as we pray, we are calling out to the sovereign God of creation. Well, what is it that they asked then, this sovereign God of creation? What was the request that they made of it? Look at verse 29. It says, and now, Lord, look upon the threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This is what they were asking. They were asking God to move in power. They were asking God to move in power. And there were some specific things that they were asking God to do, which I think, again, is just a good reminder for us is that as we pray, uh, we should be specific in some things that we're asking. It's okay to ask God for things. I mean, he says, he says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Like as we come and we ask God things, it's good to ask. Now, I think sometimes we sort of pray these prayers in such ways that God has like every out and we've never actually asked him for anything, right? Like if it's your will, could you do this? And if you don't do that, could you maybe do this? And if it's not too much trouble, could you also maybe think about doing this? But it's okay if you don't, you know, that's not how we see the New Testament church praying, 
They, they asked God, they said, God, do this. It says in your word that you want to do this. And so God, would you do that? Would you respond in this way? Would you grant us this? Would you do these things? And they knew with confidence that God would hear this request and that he would answer it. He says, hey, look upon their threats and grant to your servants this, that we would continue to speak your word with boldness. That's a prayer that God's gonna answer. It's a prayer that he's gonna respond to. I love the way that the New Testament translates it, um, or the, sorry, the NIV translates that, is that uh, to enable your servants to speak with all boldness. They're asking that God would give them what they need. And see, you notice that what they weren't praying, at no point did they ask God to take away the trial. They didn't ask for the difficulty to stop. They didn't ask for the enemies to be like kind of destroyed or taken away. That's, not what they, that's an understandable desire, but that wasn't what they were praying. They, there might be some things that you're praying that you want to pray like that. God, would you just make this thing stop? Would you take this thing away? Their prayer was in the midst of this trial, in the midst of this persecution, God, would you grant us a few things? And we see three things specifically that they were praying for. The first, I already mentioned, is boldness. They're praying for boldness. Could I just exhort you to add these to the things that you are praying about? There's probably some things, hopefully you have like a list or maybe some ideas in your head of some things that you're praying about. Could you maybe add these three things to that list? Would we follow the model that the early church has given us and begin praying for these? They were praying for boldness. As I said, some translations say, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. I think so many times when it comes to the gospel and our desire to minister and to bless others, we pray for opportunities. God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel. And I don't know if that's like, it's not that you can never pray that prayer, but I think we have been flooded. We have so many opportunities, right? I think we're praying the wrong prayer. What we need to pray is for one, wisdom to see the opportunity, to recognize it. Oh, you mean that friend or neighbor who is like kind of running through that really difficult time that keeps coming to me and asking for help? Like that's the person you want me to sort of Point to the gospel. Yes, that's the person, okay? So wisdom to see it. But the bigger prayer is the same prayer that the New Testament church is boldness to follow through, to speak. Notice what they say. Grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. This idea of boldness, I've gone through in my Bible and in books of Acts, every time boldness is mentioned, I've circled it because you see it throughout. That early church was asking God regularly for boldness, Boldness is not brash, boldness is not obnoxious, boldness is not pushy, but boldness is willing to say what needs to be said. Boldness doesn't back down from the truth. Boldness knows what people need and are willing to say it even if they disagree. Listen, church, if your goal is to speak the message of Jesus Christ and not offend anyone, that's an impossible goal. People will be offended by the message of Jesus. He offended people when he was here. How do you think you're gonna do it any better than he did? But rather, we have boldness to say what people need to hear because we live in a world, we are lost and dying without Jesus Christ. God's word is clear that all face an eternal separation from God except for the loving grace that is offered through forgiveness found in the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. This is the message that we carry with boldness, and this is what they were praying for. They said, God, would you give, our, would you give us boldness to speak your word? See, we are in a time that is not growing more conducive or sort of more accepting of the message of the Bible. Rather, it's running further from it. And this is not a time as we, such a timely message last week for the church to fall silent or to grow dim. Rather, we need to rise up with boldness and point people to the truth that we see in the gospel of Jesus. The watching world needs to see real and true followers of Jesus carrying his name and doing the things that he's called us to do. He's called us to run to those who are hurting and who are lost. This is our spiritual mission that we have been given and it's the greatest thing that we can do. Would we as a church pray this prayer? Would we pray for boldness? God, give us boldness to speak that which you've given to us. The second thing that you see them praying for is healing. They're praying for healing. They're praying for healing for those around them. While you stretch out your hand to heal. 
People all around us need healing. That is not a bad prayer to pray. In fact, that is something that Jesus did regularly. Do you remember? I mean, how much of his ministry was healing people? That's not the only thing he did, but he healed their physical disability, their physical ailment, the things that were preventing them physically from getting Jesus so that what? So that he could soften their hearts and that they could hear the spiritual need that they had. And there are people in our lives, there are people in your life, there are people, maybe even you are in a place when you need healing. Let's pray for healing as a church. Some of you, you need to be more vigilant. You need to get others around you and just ask that God would heal. Some of you have been praying for years for God to heal you in a physical way and that is something that we see in the New Testament church. That is a biblical prayer, to ask God to heal. He doesn't always, he doesn't promise that healing is coming, but for the believer, healing is coming someday. It may not happen this side of eternity, but it is promised for the other side. Healing will come and you can rest in that. But it's right and it's good to ask for that now. And the third thing we see is that, I just put his glory. It says, signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And we are a church that loves God's word and we hold up God's word and we point to God's word. We're a Bible-believing, uh, Bible-preaching church. And whenever we come across words like signs and wonders, uh, some of us get a little nervous about that. Like, oh boy, like what, what are we talking here? What is, what is this? Can I just remind us of the God that we worship, we are asking God to do miraculous things. See, he is able to do all things. We know that he's able, right? The same God that we are praying to today is the same God that parted the Red Sea. It's the same God that stopped the sun. It's the same God that brought the walls of a city down at the sound of trumpets. He's the same God that made blind to see and the lame to walk. And that same God is still working today. And I think we have given up on seeing God do miracles around us and doing some signs and doing some wonders and some of these things. See, God still does some of those very things. He is not done doing that or he's not unable to do that. Now, we maybe don't see the exact same thing that we see there. I wish I could. I mean, Paul, like he's walking, or Peter, he's like walking through town. He sees a guy that's like lame and he's like, hey, be healed. And the guy gets up. That would be an awesome thing if we could just do that, Right? Like right now, you don't need to go get your COVID vaccine. Just come to the church and we're gonna pray for you and you are going to be healed. That would be awesome. That's not how God works every time, but he still does miraculous things. What though? Why? For his glory. See, that's the difference. So many times we want to see the miraculous and the signs and the wonders done so that a ministry could be lifted up or oftentimes a man is lifted up That's never the case. Look what they say. They say signs and wonders are performed, what? Through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They're praying that God would do miraculous things, that people would see the glory of God and respond to him. Listen, church, would that be the prayer that we are praying today? And we can pray expecting a filling of the Holy Spirit. That is how God responds. Look at verse 31. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. The place physically shook. They felt the Holy Spirit there that day as a physical reminder of his presence and they were filled with him. Now a word about the filling of the Holy Spirit. We see from God's word that as you receive Jesus as your savior, you receive all of the Holy Spirit Right? He is in you and he is fully there. But filling of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's kind of, if you could think of it this way, you have all of the Holy Spirit. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Like we see that there are times when the church is filled with the Holy Spirit and times when it's not. Some of those Revelation churches were not exactly filled with the Spirit. And so this is the prayer. This is the result of the prayer is that God is filling his church with his Spirit. And would that be the expectant result that we would be longing for, looking for, that the same spirit that raised God from the dead would fill us and that he would have all of us and that we would be together in that. See, our need is the very same as these here today. We are in desperate need of a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I believe that this could be the best year that we have ever had as individuals, together, collectively, as a church, if this If we have a filling of the Holy Spirit and God is at work in us, do you believe that? 
Do you believe that if God was to fill us fully, that we would have the greatest year ever? And I'm using great in like a pretty general way. That doesn't mean that we're gonna have the most money or we're gonna have like the least amount of pain or the least amount of sadness. No, we're gonna have the most joy. We're gonna have the most fulfillment and we're gonna see God's glory go forth from this place if he fills us. And you see that he answered their prayers and he enabled them to speak the gospel, the word of God with boldness. Notice they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. If I could just kind of close us this way, you know, years ago when I was in high school, I read this book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And if you read that, it's been out for like almost 25 years, I think now. And um, Jim Cimbala, um, who pastors uh, at the Brooklyn Tabernacle still uh, to this day in New York, he, he wrote that book. And uh, in that book, uh, Pastor Cimbala, he tells the story of how God brought uh, their own prodigal daughter home. And some of you, even as we're talking about prayer, can think of your own situation, your own thing that you're kind of praying for. Well, for um, Pastor Simbola, this was the thing that was just wrecking him and his wife. Uh, their uh, daughter had walked away from the Lord. She was grown and had walked away from the home, uh, wasn't really in contact with them. And they do this Tuesday night uh, prayer meeting each week. And uh, one night, uh, Pastor Simbola had shared from God's word, actually on this passage on Acts chapter 4, about the church responding in prayer in times of tribulation, in times of trial. And, um, and he was boldly calling on God in the face of this persecution. Let me just, I'm just gonna kind of read this from, uh, from the book. It says, one cold Tuesday night during the prayer meeting, they do this Tuesday night prayer meeting every week, we entered into a time of prayer and everyone reaching out to the Lord simultaneously. And an usher handed me a note. A young woman whom I felt to be spiritually sensitive had written, Pastor Simbola, I feel impressed that we should stop the meeting and all pray for your daughter. In a few minutes, I picked up a microphone and I told the congregation what had just happened. And he said, the truth of the matter is, uh, although I haven't talked much about it, is that my daughter is far from God these days. She thinks up is down and down is up and dark is light and light is dark, but I know God can break through to her. And so I'm gonna ask so their pastor, to lead us in praying for Chrissy. Let's all join hands across the sanctuary. And as the other pastor began to lead the people, I stood behind him with my, back on his, my hand on his back. My tear ducts had run dry, but I prayed as best I knew. And there arose from the congregation a groaning, a sense of desperate determination, as if to say, Satan, you will not have this girl. Take your hands off her. She's coming back. I was overwhelmed and the force of that vast throng calling on God almost knocked me over. When I got home that night, Carol was waiting up for me. And we sat at the kitchen table drinking coffee and I said, it's over. What's over, she asked. It's over with Chrissy. You would have had to be in the prayer meeting tonight. I tell you, if there's a God in heaven, this whole nightmare is finally over. 32 hours later, on Thursday morning, my daughter walked into our house and she dropped to the kitchen floor, rocking on her hands and knees, sobbing, and she began pouring out her anguish. Daddy, Daddy, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against myself, and I've sinned against you, and Mommy, please forgive me. I pulled her up from the floor and held her close. And as we cried together, suddenly she drew back, and she said, Daddy, who was praying for me? On Tuesday night, Daddy, who was praying for me? I didn't say anything, so she continued, in the middle of the night, God woke me up and he showed me that I was heading toward this abyss. There was no bottom to it. It scared me to death. I was so frightened. I realized how hard I've been, how wrong I've been, how rebellious I was. But at the same time, it was like God wrapped his arms around me and held me tight. He kept sliding. He kept me from sliding any further as he said, I still love you. Daddy, tell me the truth. Who was praying for me Tuesday night? And I looked into her bloodshot eyes and once again, I recognized the daughter that we had raised. See, I share that to say that listen, I think sometimes we think that that kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore. Like that's the kind of stuff that just happens here in the New Testament and God kind of works in a different way. And I just, I just wanna remind us that he's still working that way. 
And some of us are in this place where we need God to do some signs and some wonders and some miraculous things. See, we're not just a learning church, we're a doing church. One of the things we like to say around here is we're not lacking for information. What we desperately need is application. And so what I want us to do is I want us to respond in application in prayer. And there's two ways that we're going to do that. For this month, we're going to have a focus of prayer around here. We're going to be sending out some resources to walk through prayer for the remainder of this month. We want to culminate that in a time of prayer at the end of the month together here in this place and online. But I want to begin this week by us calling out to the Lord. What is it that you are desperately seeking, desperately longing for him to move in? And do you believe that he can do that? And know this, I read this book this week and was just reminded fresh. This is on like my rotation. Do any of you have books that you kind of read on rotation? I read this one every few years, just remind myself. See, God can do some incredible things when the people of God pray. He works through the prayers of his people. And we need to grow as a church in our dependency on prayer this coming year. It was there for sure at the beginning as we were planting and launching this church, but it is so easy to slip. And I want to make sure that it doesn't get far away. And so we're not just going to make time. We can fit it in or it's just going to be one of those things on the side. This is going to be something. We're going to continue to build the foundation of this church with prayer. This is how this church began. This is how we're going to continue to minister and to grow. And secondly, I would ask if you need to respond right now. I'm going to invite some of our elders and their wives to come up and just be available here at the front. And I just wonder, as we sing this next song, is there somebody here today that needs prayer? And they're up front here, and I know maybe it's awkward to sort of come and stand up, but but would you respond and say, listen, I need God to work. Let's believe that God answers the prayers of his people. All you have to do is come and say, hey, I need prayer. Share what it is. They have their masks on. You can keep yours on. We want to do it well, but they're just going to pray for you. Would we say, I need a filling of the Spirit right now? And if you're online, maybe you just want to pause and pray with those that are there with you, your family, your roommates. Or if you're alone, you can click that request prayer, that live prayer button, and that'll open a chat, and someone's there that would love to pray with you. Give them some time. If there's several of you, they might take a few minutes, but just wait. Someone's going to get on there and pray with you. Let's respond and let's seek God in prayer. And so we're going to sing. As we sing, just come forward. If you need prayer, come forward. I believe that someone needs healing, that someone has healing for someone in their life. I believe that someone needs salvation. Somebody needs God to answer and to work. Let's respond in that. Come now, and we're going to pray for these remaining minutes together.